This is lecture 17 of Analytics for Business and Economics. We're going to look at checking assumptions of the analysis of variance that we were doing in the previous lecture. You remember a couple of times I said, okay, keep this in mind because we're going to be we're going to be dealing with this in the next lecture. Well, it's the next lecture, so um, we have to deal with some of the basic assumptions to make sure that the conclusions we draw from analysis of variance are valid. All right, so with that, let's jump right in. Okay, we are back. We're checking the assumptions of ANOVA. We have the base, same basic setup that we always have in these lectures. Notes on the left-hand side, um, our studio on the right-hand side. I can make that just like this. And we're gonna keep, you know, my lecture is just a little bit wide for right now because we're, we're gonna talk a little more of the theory to begin with. And a few of the assumptions that we need. Well, one of the things we talked about was that analysis of variance, what it does is it's fundamentally comparing how spread out the data is overall versus how spread out each group is. And if the spread overall is much, much wider or bigger than that of the individual groups, then we draw the conclusion that the um, at least one mean is different for one of the groups. So at least one of the group means is different. But as you can probably see within that, underlying that assumption is that the variance of all the groups or the, the spread of each one of the groups or dispersion, I guess would be another word for it, of each one of those groups is the same. So like, for example, if we have one that's massively more dispersed, so a lot more variance, a lot more, a much bigger standard deviation than the other groups, well, then even if the mean is the same, you're going to see a difference between the average of the group standard deviations or group variances and the overall uh, variance of all of the data. Um, and so that can throw our results off and make it invalid. And so one of the things we need to do is we need to check to make sure something that in the book we call homogeneity of variance. All right, within when in the next chapter, when we talk about regression, we're gonna say, hey, there's no heteroscedasticity. I know that's a big word. Heteroscedasticity is just the spreaded outiness of the data, right? The scatter of the data differs, all right? So different spread is essentially what that means. And we're saying, we don't want that. We want it to have the same spread all over. So basically when we think about, you know, how, how our data is distributed, we want it to be a little like butter on toast. Nice even coat over the whole bread. We don't wanna, we don't wanna miss, we don't want to miss some spots of the toast that don't have butter, and we don't want to have too much butter on other places, right? We want a nice, even spread. That's what we mean, homogeneity of variance. In other words, if you really want to look at it brass tacks, when I plot the box plot of the different groups like we did last time, I want the, those boxes to be about the same height on each one of them. Right? That's In its simplest form, that's kind of what we're looking for. Um, and so we need to test this, and... The second thing that we have is normality. So our residuals from the test need to be normally distributed. Now, what the heck is a residual? I'm gonna push pause on that. I'm gonna punt until next module. When we talk about linear regression, it's gonna make more sense what we mean by a residual, but I'll give the basic definition right now. It is the variability in the data that's left unexplained by our model. In other words, it's the part of the data's variability or changing that we aren't able to explain with the, the variable that we're using. So for example, in before, when we talked about before with uh, the three different drugs in our drug trial, all right, there was some variability within each group, right? It changed beyond the mean. It was different from the mean, right? Well, these are, the, those are the, that's what's left residual, you know, that that why do we have someone who's taking Joyzepan who still doesn't get as high, high that that high a mood gain? Well, that's that's the individual variability that's left random, all right? Well, not left random, left un, unexplained by our model. So that's where we're at at this point. Um, I if if residuals don't exactly make sense, don't worry about that. We will talk about it much much more in the next chapter. Um, but for now, we just need them to be normal. And so I'm gonna show you how to test to make sure they're normal. And I'll show you more about that later. Okay, so the first thing we have to do is of course load our data. This is the same clinical trial data that we had before. So if you don't understand what's going on, 
in this code that I'm I'm highlighting right now, um, go back to the previous lecture and rewatch that. All right, we'll go through that. The next thing is, of course, we're calculating the average for mood gain. All right, and we're using, or I'm sorry, we're calculating the analysis of variance for mood gain. Again, if you don't know what's going on here, go watch the previous lecture. Okay, and so now we have conducted our analysis of variance of mood gain based on which drug they took, all right, which drug grouping they were in, whether it's placebo, axofree, or joyzepam. Right. Now we need to assess these two assumptions. The first assumption is homogeneity of variance. And my number, number one way to assess this is to look at the box plot. I'm going to show you a statistical test. It's a good, it's a fine statistical test. There's, there's some issues with all statistical tests. They're all based on some assumptions. We need to make sure that we don't violate those assumptions. Sometimes we just have to cross our fingers and hope we don't violate those assumptions. But the bottom line is when you can plot the data, plot it, right? Get a look at it. It will help you avoid silly mistakes. It won't help you avoid all the mistakes that are out there. There's a lot of mistakes that you can make in terms of data analytics, but it'll help you avoid the really, really disastrously silly um, ones. And so plot the data. It doesn't take very much. It doesn't hurt you. You know, basically it's almost zero cost to plot this data, so do it. Okay, and we just want to look at these. And basically what I want to see is I'd like these boxes. You know, ideally the box and whiskers should be about the same size. Now they may be transferred up, so you know one may be higher than another, but the actual distance from the top of the box to the bottom of the box needs to be about the same. And we can see for the placebo and for joyzepan, it's about the same. But for axifree, it's not. So in this case, I'm going to really question whether or not we really do meet this homogeneity of variance assumption. All right, the spread of the data looks different for the different groups. Now you can say, well, if I'm looking at this box, how close do they have to be? Well, it's a little bit, I can't really answer that. It's kind of one of those judgment calls you develop as you look at a bunch of them. Um, I can tell you this one, it's pretty obvious that Axafree is a bigger box than Joy's a Pan or Placebo. Um, and that really, this has got me concerned that maybe we need to do something about this homogeneity of variance assumption. Okay, so what should we do? Well, I'm a little out of order here. I wanna come up here. We're gonna use something called the CAR package. The CAR package, it's called CAR because it stands for Companion for Applied Regression. There was a famous textbook called on Applied Regression, and this is the companion R package for that textbook. I really don't know the textbook, haven't read it. I have used the R package a lot, and there's a ton of really useful functions in here that are really helpful. Um, and so we use it. And so I'm gonna use Pac-Man to load car, this will install car if it's not been installed and then load it or just load it. So there we go. And we're gonna use a function from the car package called the Levine test. So Levine's test for um, homogeneity of variance um, basically looks at, are the variants based on groups the same or different? And what we're gonna do is we can do this in a couple of ways. One of the ways that we can do that is we can just give Levine test the same data we give the um, analysis of variance, um, the analysis of variance um, function. So we're gonna say explain mood.gave.gain using drug, all right, and get your data from clinical trial. And this is what it spits out. Now the null hypothesis for the Levine test is that the variances are equal across all groups. The alternative is at least one variance is different. So we come down here and we find an F statistic of 1.5 ish and a P value of 0.26. So the Levine test anyway says, hey, look, we failed to reject the null hypothesis that the variances are equal. So let's take a step back from that result though, because all of a sudden now we have a result that's contradicting kind of what I was thinking with respect to the box plot. Well, let's think a couple things. Number one, 
What's the null hypothesis? The null hypothesis is that all groups are equal. For our purposes, we almost want to flip that around because the thing is, we want to show that they're all equal. And here all we're doing is failing to prove that they're not all equal. Okay, so it's a much lower threshold for showing that than what maybe we think. Um, it's very standard to use this test and use it just like this. But in my mind, the, the, the hypothesis is a little bit backwards. Um, we should, we should flip-flop those two, but that's not so easy to do. Um, which goes back to this Levine test is great. It's a good tool, but it's no substitute for looking at the box plots. I can tell you in the box plots, I don't think the variances are quite, are, are quite close enough to one another that I shouldn't be worried about it. Although I can tell you from the box plot, we know Joy Zapan definitely is higher than the rest of them. I mean, it just, they just are. Um, but that said, we do get these kind of contradicting results. And so what do you do? Well, this is where statistics stops being a little bit the science and starts being an art, all right? We have to practice our art. And one of the things that we're gonna practice is, well, which one do we trust? Here I know this Welsh one-way test isn't going to be invalid if we have homogeneous variants, but our analysis of variance is. So when I see a box plot like this, I think I'm going to go ahead and err on the safe side and do something about it. And so what do we do about that? Well, if the assumption is violated, if the homogeneous variance assumption is violated, we can use the one way dot test command. And that provide and that does the Welsh one way test. So this is a non-parametric test. So it's similar to analysis of variance. It's not one that I'm going to be able to go into the math with for you in this class. Um, that's beyond the scope of this class. But fortunately, it's already programmed in right here. One way dot test. Okay. And to do that, we're going to do one way dot test and give it exactly the same argument as we did for analysis of variance. And I know I'm kind of going through all of this without going in any code. I'm going to backtrack and, and step through this whole process once for you um, as soon as I'm done um, talking through it. OK, so in any event, we've got one way dot test. Bing, we follow this in. And guess what? We still have a very low p value. So we still conclude, yep, there's at least one mean that's different. Easy peasy. Now, it's also important, I don't know which mean is different. And I don't know by how much. I just know that there's at least one mean that's different. In the next chapter, we'll talk a little bit more about how we can identify, you know, how much of an effect is does each group have on the mean. Okay, so next. The next assumption is the normality of the residuals. By far and away, my in my opinion, the best way to look at the normality of the residuals is to do a histogram. And, and basically this histogram should look like kind of like a mountain, or sometimes I think it's like, you know, somebody giving you the middle finger. Um, you know, I'm juvenile, but that's okay. Um, it should basically be um, low on either edge and kind of have a hump in the middle. And to be honest, this analysis is really, really robust to this normality assumption. In other words, the data doesn't have to be perfectly normally distributed for this to be to be fine. All right, it just has to be reasonably close. I look at this this data plot. This is reasonably close. High in the middle, low on the sides, and no weirdness. I mean, if we had like two humps, you know, so high on the outside, high on the um, you know, high on the wings, you know, on the tails, and low in the middle then we might have a problem, okay? Or if we had a lot of skew or an outliers or something like that, that we would have showed up when we did our box plots and whatnot, then we might have a problem. But as long as it looks something like this, in general, it's gonna be fine. Um, the next thing that we can do is what's called the QQ norm plot or the QQ plot. Um, and basically what this is doing is it is plotting the, um, the residuals that have, after they've been standardized. So I'm really not going to go into the math on this one. Basically, what you want to be able to do is essentially draw a straight line 
through the dots. And if it, they follow a really close straight line, then your data is pretty close to normally distributed. The farther away from a straight line your dots go, the, 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 less, the less it is. I'll show you another way to get at this plot that's a little more clear because it'll draw the line in for you. Um, but basically, as long as, so this one, this is really close to normal. It's close enough anyways. It's very close to a straight line. I'm, I'm not worried about it. The final way to do it, and these are going in order from my most favorite to my least favorite, is something called the Shapiro-Wilk test. Now, the Shapiro-Wilk test, there are some assumptions behind it, but it is a statistical test. Um, it can be a little finicky. It can be sensitive to the issues within the data. So, yep, yeah, I'm going to have you do it. It's in the textbook. I have it in the case studies, but... Um, this is definitely my least favorite way of determining whether residuals are normal. I, I mean, I still think, hey, the, the, the histogram is the best because here's the thing. It will not only tell you, okay, yeah, it's approximately normal, but it will also give you some guidance on, oh, well, guess what? There's, there's some weird thing going on in the data. You know, I have an outlier I have, or I have a, a lot of skew or I have something like that that just looks weird. Well, that might actually be an indicator that you have a problem somewhere else in the model or in the data to look at. Um, so, I, you know, this this histogram just does a lot of does a lot of heavy lifting for you um, in a way that the QQ norm or the uh, or the QQ plot or the um, or, or especially the Shapiro Wilk test won't necessarily. The other thing is, I I kind of have to say within, um, oh, and I have a typo here. So my null and alternative hypothesis here. Oh, no, I'm sorry. Um, oh, I'm right. I'm sorry. I don't. I'm right here. Um, is that to me, it reverses the, the null and the alternative hypothesis for what we really want to be able to do. Um, and that is the null hypothesis is that the data is normally distributed. So we're assuming it's normal and then proving it's not rather than assuming it's not normal and proving it is. Um, the alternative is that the data is not normally distributed. Again, this this is a commonly accepted practice. We do it all the time, and it is very useful because flip, flipping that um, null and alternative hypothesis is really difficult. But um, you know, it's still it's just not my favorite. And the easiest way to do that is Shapiro.test, and and um, we um, give it the residuals. So there's this residuals function. There's another way to do this. I'll show you both ways in just a minute. Um, but you need to get the actual residuals from the model because this doesn't work on just an ANOVA. This, just, this function just works on data. It asks, is the data you're giving me normal or not? And we look at this and you'll notice on, on the uh, case four, I believe it is, I have, a, I have a few times where I'm going to ask you to run this test, and then I mistakenly ask for the F statistic from this test. That was a typo. I thought I got it fixed. I remember fixing it, but for some reason, it's not fixed on, on case four. So I apologize. Um, but um, it should say, you know, the test statistic for the Shapiro-Wilk test. And so that's this W equals. So don't let that throw you off. I know it's not an F statistic. Um, but it was a, it was definitely a typo in the, the quiz. So forgive me. And then you have your P value. And of course, if the P value is small, reject the null. In this case, the P value is huge. So we fail to reject the null hypothesis that the data is normally distributed, which is not surprising because it looks pretty normal to me. All right. So those are our assumptions. Now, what do we do about it? So let's say, we have, and forgive me, I think I got a little out of order here. Um, let's say I have um, non-homogeneous variance. I just run the one-way test. All right, and again, we get a consistent result. Let's say I have non-normal um, distribute or dis, um, residuals. I can do um, the Kurskull-Wallace test, um, which is also a non-parametric version of ANOVA. And what do we get? I do Kurskull-Wallace give it the exact same argument as I would the AOV function, and it spits it out, boom. Happen, it is, uh, the test happens to be a chi-squared distribution, which is fine. We get a p-value of 0 0.002. So again, 
at the five percent well even at the one percent significance level we reject the null hypothesis if they're all the same so we get the same results okay we'll take um, a quick breath all right now we're going to go ahead and let's just do this from start to stop okay i'm going to go ahead i'm going to put one one thing in here i've already loaded my data and and run my analysis of variance okay i have my mood dot gain right there i can come down here and i do all my calculations so we did it by hand once and now we have this this um analysis of variance object where we run it once it's called results so i'm just gonna i'm gonna copy this for right now come right down here so we just have a, a clean start and if i run that bing i get my my results that makes sense so what do we do next well the very next thing we need to do is we actually we need to um, in fact we've already done it because we should have already done the box plot before we even ran this but I think it's really important we do a box plot and I can use just the exact same argument I'm going to use this argument over and over again so I'm going to hit copy this formula mood.gain tilde drug and then tell it that the data is in, cl in clinical trial I'm going to paste that right in then I'm just going to run this this one line 71 by pressing com by having my cursor in the line and pressing command enter and there we go I have my thing and I can see from the box plot I tend to think this data has does not have homogeneous variants or has heterogeneous variances um, so we violate that assumption so we need to do something Okay, we're going to run the library function to load the car package. You have to make sure you have it installed first. Um, the Pac-Man package will do that. So if you do Pac-Man colon colon p load car, that'll work as well. Um, I just don't have car, the Pac-Man package loaded right now in this in this um, R package, R project. All right, great. Bing. So now I have car in there. That's fine. And what I'm going to do is the Levine test. So that's L E V. There is a Levine dot test, but it's called a defunct function. That means they depreciated it in 2009. They don't want you to use it. Um, they want you to use this one, Levine with a capital T test. Um, that's done. It's done that way for backwards compatibility. But all right, we're going to do it two different ways. One of the ways you can do it is Levine test. And then just put in, I saved my output from an AOV to this func to this variable called results. So I can just do that. And it gives me my, t my statistic. So here, 0 0.2618. If I look over here where I had it before, let me go up here. All right, here's my Levine test. I can also do it by simply repeating the argument from the um, from what we gave AOV, and we get exactly the same results. Okay, so there's a Levine test. Now, what do we do about it? Because one way dot test, and we need to give it the same argument that we gave AOV. Bing, we run that. And one way dot test does a nice job of putting its summary output. So you don't have to save it as an object and, and run it through the summary command, which is nice. OK, next thing we need to do, we're going to check the normality of the residuals. So how we did it before is the first thing we did was we looked at just a histogram. Well, the command for a histogram is H-I-S-T. Then I'm going to do it a little bit differently. I'm going to type in results. Um, and notice it says mood.gain underscore AOV. That's what I called it in the lecture notes. Here I'm just calling it results. I can call it whatever I want to. I'm going to hit the dollar sign. I'm going to type in residuals. Oh, and they popped up. There they are, the residuals. Bang. That's another way of doing it. This function works or this works. Either way, gets you the same thing. All right, this is a little squished, but basically same thing. Next, let's do the QQ norm plot. 
So I'm going to show you a little bit different way to do it. You can do plot the residuals, or I can do plot. Okay, just do plot, and I'm going to give it my um, uh, ANOVA object. R O R E S U U L T S. R E S U L T S. That's fine, and we'll plot that. And it gives us a few different plots, right? So the first one is residuals versus fit plot. All right, that's that's a handy one. There's my QQ plot. All right, and notice it draws a line, that dotted line, through the residuals, through these little dots. Well, as long as your dots follow that line, it's it's reasonably normal. There's a few other plots that are in here. Probably the easiest way to do this might be to do comma, which equals two. And that will focus in on just the QQ plot. Right, it's the second one out of those. So just show me the, the QQ plot. That's another way to do it. This, this command over here also will give you a QQ plot. Here's the thing. In, in R, there's always 50 ways to do, the, do an R do a thing. There's almost always more than one way. Then the final thing is this Shapiro test. And again, the Shapiro test, we just need to give it the residuals because it's it, it just cares about the data. It doesn't care about the model at all. And paste. We're going to let this stay magic for right now, but it's not going to work in this one because instead of it being called that, it's going to be called results. And this residual function, we're just not going to worry about what residuals are. I mean, if I put that, it just gives me a whole bunch of numbers. Um, we will talk more about those in the next uh, chapter. But there we go. Bing. And again, we find the same as we did before, which makes sense. 0. 0.6 is huge, so we fail to reject that we have normally distributed data. But let's just say we didn't have, let's say this was 0 0.001 and that we knew normality of my residuals was a problem. Well, then we can do the Kerskill test, Kerskill Wallace test. And, you know, it's just like doing the AOV function. The only difference is you put Kerskill.test in front of it instead of um, AOV. If I run that line, I end up with this guy and I still have. A really small p-value, so I reject the null hypothesis and determine, yep, at least one group has um, less, um, has a different variance. All right. Well, that sums it up for this module. Talk to you later.